It was in 1993 that Charles Colson received the Templeton Prize for progress in religion. The $1 million prize is the highest it's given of any of these kinds of awards that are out there, such as the Nobel Prizes and those kinds of things in the fields of science and literature. But the belief is, is that religion is actually kind of more important than that to the Templeton people. And so Colson, having served seven months in prison for obstructing justice in the Watergate cover-up, was known as that scandal's hatchet man in the Nixon administration. There in prison, his conversion later led him to the founding of Prison Fellowship in 1976. And of course, it's been a magnificently used uh, vehicle of the Lord for the proclamation of the gospel to many, many thousands of people. And in his response to this award, Colson said, out of tragedy and adversity come great blessings. I shudder to think of what I would have been if I had not gone to prison. So sometimes it's in the worst of events, in the most difficult of circumstances, that we find that God does his largest works in our lives. Adversity can be truly God's refining fire. Now, most of us in here have never served a time in jail, nor have we been locked up in prison. Uh, I've visited prisons a few times, and I was always happy to uh, be able to go in and share the gospel, but to hear the clink as I went out or the other side. However, spiritually speaking, we have all been through what we might call certain prison experiences in life. Times when uh, it seems that the Lord had us shut up in some sort of locked into affliction for his own purposes. Times when we wondered where he was, why he was doing this to us, as in Dean's testimony, why did God have him struggling on that farm and going to school for subjects that had really nothing to do with what God had called him to, Though, of course, later on, he saw that it was all preparation for God's perfect plan for his life. The times when maybe we wonder just how you got to that spot and when is it going to end? When is this time of affliction, this time of confusion, and this time of being kind of locked up in life for some circumstance? When is it going to pass? When are you going to get to a new day? And wondering why, if God really loves you, I mean, if he really loves you, you read that he does, you know, why is he allowing this kind of stuff to happen in your life? Well, I think we can find some encouragement today in the passage that we go to as we continue our series. And today we go to the book of Acts, of course. We're looking through that this summer to Acts in chapter 16. Have you ever thought that prison or these kinds of prison experiences could really be ultimately a blessing? Well, Paul and Silas, as we go to chapter 16, verse 16 and following, will discover that prison indeed turned out for them to be a really glorious place to be. And by making prayer and fellowship, and, and, and rather prayer and worship, I should say, by making this prayer and worship, and particularly the prayers in prison, their first impulse, rather than their last resort, they found that not only they had an answer to the problem, but that God had additionally opened up for them some new avenues of ministry as a result. So over the summer, we have been talking through the book of Acts, particularly looking at a variety of passages where prayer is especially focused. And we see in the book of Acts that these folks didn't do anything before they went to the Lord first in prayer. Or well, before they went to do something or when they were in the midst of a conflict or a problem, their first impulse was to turn to God in prayer. And along the way, also, we are seeing how this early church, these early first believers in Christ, lived in a culture that was decidedly anti-Christian, anti the things that they were talking about. And we particularly see that, of course, in our passage today. So today, we want to sh save a good bit of time for our youth to come and report very appropriately upon the opportunities that they've had on their own mission adventure and their missionary journey of the summer. And so we're going to quickly work through a text here today. Again, Acts 16, beginning in verse 16, we're going to read down through verse 40. Kind of, we kind of need to read through this passage, and let's just kind of think and talk our way through it a little bit. Here's what it says, beginning in verse 16. And this is in the city of Philippi. This is uh, on the second of Paul's missionary journeys. It's Paul and Silas. Uh, they've already gotten tossed out of a couple of towns that they've been in. And so this is in Philippi. So once it says, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave 
who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. So now Luke is writing this, and you can see the way he puts himself in the narrative that Luke at this point is actually traveling on the missionary journey with Paul and Silas. And in this journey, they come upon this girl who has a spirit. The literal translation of the Greek in this is the word is a python. A python. Isn't that special? Um, I, I, you, know, you know my story with snakes and how I don't deal well with snakes, you know. But it, 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 the whole idea was, and it related to some of the Greek culture and the Greek gods and, the, and this kind of thing. But the idea is that this was this evil spirit that was in her and some demonic type of... Um, Cultic, occult type presence and through it she was able to predict the future those who owned her were able to make a profit from her ability and capacities to do this so you can see it is an evil situation and of course she is in a greater power now around these missionaries who are there and ministering by God's power in the spirit uh, of the Lord and the Holy Spirit and and so she can't help it. We see this a number of times in the scriptures, particularly in the, in the, in the narratives around Christ, where, where the demons understand who is there and what is around them, and, and they actually speak the truth. And so she's actually speaking the truth here when she says, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Now, that's true. At first glance, it seems like this is a great endorsement of this well-known person in town who had an ability that was rather miraculous. I mean, it was evil, but it was miraculous, that it would seem like this is a great thing. But rather, it's kind of annoying to be associated with this gal who keeps kind of following and making these, making these, uh, these statements. And, uh, and certainly the people hearing it would not be able to you know, parse and make the distinction between what Paul uh, and Silas would be preaching versus what this power was. And not wanting to be seen as, as you know coming from the same source, and so it says she kept this up for many days. Verse eighteen. This is why I love Paul. You know, I think uh, Paul and Dean were probably similar characters. You know, it says finally, because Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, "In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her." And at that moment, the spirit left her. So, Paul, it, it just cracks me up when it says, you know, Paul just became so annoyed, he, he had enough of it. Turns, out goes the spirit. Well, when her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept. Our practice and so the owners grab them drag them in front of the local powers that be and 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 kind of exaggerate the charges here a little bit they were Jewish people Jews were not apparently well received at that point in the culture in that town and that had something to do with some of the history of what was going on at the time and of course they were speaking of things that from a Roman perspective would be alien to uh, all that the Roman culture and, and the empire was about. And so, um, they're throwing our city into an uproar by advocating unlawful customs. And so they trump up these charges before the authorities. And as if it's not a bad, as bad, 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 the crowd, in verse 22, joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. Now, why would the crowd jump in and do this? Perhaps there's some way in which uh, many of the people in the crowd, being very familiar with this gal and with her capacities and abilities and so forth, that maybe in some way these people or the town benefited as well from this slave girl and this cult work that was going on through her and seeing it no longer available, perhaps that motivated them to join in. Uh, although we see throughout ancient culture that folks were rather quick to get together and, and, and just have a good time having a riot. But uh, whatever, they have this big event. Uh, Paul and Silas are beaten, and after they've been severely flogged, it says they're thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them and carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. So they're thrown in prison. They have their feet 
uh, thrown in the stocks so that they cannot move. It must have been a terribly uncomfortable place. It seems to be in some sort of inner sanctum type of place of the, the, the prison, deep down into the bowels of it, and the jailer commanded to carefully, carefully watch them that they not get out. They had seen some power come from these guys. and Who knows what kind of power they might have, so put them in, in the nastiest, dingiest, most confined, locked up possible situation, and that's what the jailer does. And so, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. Now, it didn't start at midnight. They had been praying. And their prayer broke out into singing hymns to God, probably some of the, the psalms that they would know from their, their Jewish background. And uh, the other prisoners were listening to them. So this is truly what you call a captive audience for a concert that's going on there. And, uh, and suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And at once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Now, this part of the, the world, which would be in modern-day Turkey, is a part of the world that, that where earthquakes are common. So it was not unusual for them to experience a, a, a good rumble or shake. But this particular one also had such a, a, a capacity to it that it burst, burst open the doors, the chains fall off. This is not normal sorts of um, uh, an earthquake for the time. And so the jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, what would you think? You would think, well, the, 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 yeah, the guys, the, they're gone already. Now, this jailer guy is probably a retired... Um, military officer from the Roman legions and, and uh, probably a person of a good bit of authority in town. But one thing he knew for sure is that he was in charge with uh, handling these prisoners and you didn't dare not um, come up with the right tally of prisoners at the end of the day. If you lose someone on your watch, well, you just kind of, well, you just say goodbye. You're done. You're gone. You're out of here. Uh, you're dead. Well, so he wakes up, sees the prison doors open. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. Well, the jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, he had probably heard and was familiar with the story of the slave girl, of the power that was evidenced there that put them in prison. Obviously, if there's an earthquake, you would not expect the earthquake to loosen chains and, and set people free and doors to go. I mean, all of this evidence to him that there was something very uh, divine and powerful about this. Certainly, he didn't understand. Uh, yeah, tell me now. Come, come on out here and let me hear about all this Jesus stuff. Now, maybe he'd heard some of it in the singing and, and the praying and all of that. But whatever it was, he knew he was in the presence of some power that he did not have, that he wanted to have, and he wanted to hear about. And they replied to the question, seizing upon it, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved in your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. So he must have had the authority, the ability to take them even to his home. And that hour of the night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds, of course, it could be that he lived right, actually, right there as part of, of what he did. But anyhow, he, he cares for them, and immediately he and all his household were baptized. So you see this whole household come to Christ, and before the night's over, they're baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and sent a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. And then we finish off the story. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order to release those men. Well, they really knew they couldn't hold them and keep them. They didn't have any uh, uh, real charges against them. And the jailer told Paul, the magistrates, in order that you and Silas be released, so now you can leave and go, go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, that's the guys who had come, saying they can be released, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison. And you can imagine the guys at this point, when they heard that they were Roman citizens, you can imagine them thinking that this is just a bunch of riffraff, let them go, we can't care, charge them. They're Roman citizens. You can just imagine the guys going, oh, no, oh, no, what did, what, what did we, what they had done it was un, unlawful, taking Roman citizens and, and beating them in this way. And so, uh, 
when the officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. Now they might be the guys in trouble with the folks down the road and across the sea over there in Rome when they heard about this. And so they came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them, please, just leave town. And Paul and Silas came out of the prison. They went to Lydia's house. That's from the previous passage. Of course, you know that because all of you are following along with us online, right? Right? At the impulse, try state fell, impulse tsf.org, where you read the daily devotionals. And so that would have been a part of your reading this week. You know that Lydia was the first one to come to faith um, in that town and, um, and, and really kind of the first of Gentile people to, to come to faith. And so. Uh, they go to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and sisters, these new believers in Christ, encouraged them, and then they left the town. Well, today, so that, since we're taking a shorter window of time than usual, and I want to just quickly move right now into making several points for us to be mindful of as we would seek to apply this passage into our lives. We need to understand the difference between two things. And this is what I'm going to take off on in our just couple of minutes together here. We need to understand the difference between the inner realities that we have and the outer circumstances that we face. When I talk about inner realities, I'm talking about how we are a child of the King of Kings. That's who we are. If we have named Christ, if we have come to salvation in Christ, we are adopted into his family. We possess all that stuff that we talked about in our recent series on crosswords, the adoption, the propitiation, the reconciliation, all those wonderful things that we have because of the work of Christ we're part of God's family. That's the inner reality. We have incredible guarantees of future security, of eternal promise and reward. Our current standing in the world is one that is great as well because we are, as it's Paul said, 2 Corinthians, we are ambassadors. We are the ambassadors of the eternal King of Kings and his kingdom to this uh, earthly world, uh, bearing witness to this lost world in a ministry of reconciling people back to God who have walked away and do not know him, of bringing them to faith. This is a tremendous ministry that we have. We have wonderful realities in our faith in Christ. That's the inner truth. But the outer circumstances do not always correspond to that inner truth in a one-to-one -one correspondence. By outer circumstances, I'm talking about how we deal with the world. Though we live even now with eternal life, it's not that eternal life begins on the other side of this life in heaven. We already have eternal life that continues on through eternity. Our current status is one where we are not, until we get to that other side, we are not now recognizing all the benefits that are ours. We live in a world where sin and injustice continues to prevail often. We live in a world um, where the kingdom of darkness continues for this time to have great authority and power. The majority of the people in this world in which we live do not see the truths that we see and understand from the scriptures. They do not accept these truths. They do not trust in this. They do not think at all in the way that we think, which is the way that is tied to the issues of eternal life. And we are spoken often in scriptures as in this world being aliens in a world that does not accept or receive us, even as they did not accept or receive Jesus Christ. So those are outer circumstances, inner realities, but outer circumstances. That's what I'm talking about. Let me quickly list four connections of our inner realities and our outer circumstances that particularly stand out to me relative to the passage we've looked at today in this consideration of Acts 16. The first thing is to say this that our outer circumstances are expected to be of a difficult nature due to the cross we carry in following Christ. Now, what I'm speaking of here is how when we come to faith in Christ, it says that we take up our cross and follow him. And in doing that, it's to be expected that it's going to be often a difficult time when we follow the Lord. I'm talking about the normal expectation of persecution and opposition. We must remember this fact that it is a fact of the Christian life. I've often spoken to you about how we need to calibrate our systems of expectations, how we need to establish a biblical sense of par. It's a golfing term. What is the, what is the expectation? We need to have a calibrated sense of that. And in that calibrated sense of that, we understand that persecution and opposition is going to be the normal experience of the believer. 
And there are going to be times where the Lord shuts us up and locks us up in some way in what seems to be a prison. And when this happens, of course, it's never a pleasant time. And during those times, it doesn't seem like God cares about the things that we're facing. It seems like maybe we're just tossed aside without any regard for our well-being. But of course, such is not the case at all. We're His, and He is working out His best plan for us, and that involves, as it did with Christ, as it did with Paul, as it did with anyone who sought to walk with the Lord and carry the cross. It, it involves a certain amount of suffering, but in that we grow in our faith, and we grow in our trust and dependence, and we become more like the Lord. Even back to the Old Testament time, you think of Joseph and all the trials that he went through. You think of Joseph, this faithful young guy, who has his brothers send him, you know, throw him, sell him off as a slave, and he ends up as a slave in Egypt, and then he's do, doing nothing there but the right things and honoring God with his life and his speech and, and his character, and he's falsely accused, and he's in prison, and all of these things, and you've got to wonder, where is God in these things that are going on in his life? And at the end of the story, as it goes on, you find out that God had him in those situations for all that God was going to accomplish through him that he could have never anticipated that was so much bigger than any service or way of life and living that he could have ever anticipated for himself, such that he was able even to look at his brothers and ultimately say to them, and forgiving them, yes, you meant it for harm, but God meant all of these things for good. And that's what's going on. God means these things for good. So we should understand that it's kind of normal that these things are going to happen. Here's the second thing to say, that our outer circumstances do not have to control our inner realities. No, they cannot change the truth of the inner realities of who we are in Christ. They do not have to affect our inner being, our emotions, and our inner peace. Paul and Silas, surely they were in pain. Surely they were scared. Surely they were uncomfortable and miserable. Yet they did not allow their circumstances to defeat them. But they went to God in prayer. And that's what we need to do when we're locked away in some of the difficult circumstances to have us in kind of the prison experiences of life. And one of the surest ways to overcome our prison experiences are to, the surest way, surest ways is to learn that secret of praising God in the midst of pain. We see that modeled again by the saints of old of Job, who when all the word of all the losses came to him in that first chapter in the book of Job, responded to this by saying and falling to the ground in worship and saying, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And in all of this, the scripture says, he did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. And so it is true. God does not leave us forever stuck in our circumstances. Job was rewarded also in the end. We gain new perspectives when looking back and always seeing how, how God has indeed been good in all of the things of the past and how he delivers us ultimately to his reward by taking us from this outer world of circumstances to himself. Here's a third thing to say, is that our inner realities when expressed through prayer and worship bring a new perspective upon our outer circumstances. This is essentially the previous point, just simply turned inside out. Anyone can praise God when everything's going well in life, but it takes a real faith to praise his name when the bottom falls out from under us in our circumstances. And in fact, the depth of our faith is really measured by how well we do trust God and his commitment of his love to us when in fact the pressure is on and the things go poorly in life. And that's when the real you and the real faith in you is truly measured and seen. And then a final thing to say is this. Our inner realities, when publicly displayed through faith, testify of our eternal perspective about our circumstances, our outer circumstances. When we have those, those uh, difficult circumstances in life, but we plow on through them in confidence in faith, what it does is it speaks volumes to a watching world around us because it is not normal behavior to bear up under sufferings and injustice and to do injustice with a sense of joyful trust in God. Our testimony for Christ is greatest when we display our confidence and our comfort as sourced in a world that's beyond this one. Our eternal reality, that is that inward reality of our relationship with God and through Christ. And this abnormal trust is particularly evident when we pray and when we worship, as Paul and Silas did in this situation. 
a watching world is struck by a reality of a relationship such as this that they do not possess in the difficult times. It's one that they often in some way recognize. As the, as the world looks in, they somewhat recognize that in the believer who, who suffers well through injustice and, 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 and the misadventures of life, trusting God joyfully in the midst of it, they see that as sort of that God-shaped vacuum kind of thing that they in some way instinctively kind of know that they don't possess but wish that they had. And so it becomes a wonderful witness into, to the world. So our culture would tell us that prayer and worship are self-delusional things, simply things by which we medicate ourselves, and we do find peace and comfort in the Lord as we go to Him in prayer. But merely religious people look to God when God's useful. He makes me feel good or He settles my problems, you know. But religious people therefore make worship and joy dependent upon their circumstances. If God blesses me, then I will praise Him and feel happy. If I experience failure or loss, I may feel guilty about my failures and resent that God has these circumstances that He's placed me in as kind of like an injustice in my life. But the Gospel tells us, as the song says, that God is indeed good all the time. And we distinguish rightly between what is comfort and what is joy. Comfort uh, focuses on accumulating wealth, whereas joy is found in giving it away. Comfort's about investment. Joy is about divestment. Comfort numbs pain, whereas joy coexists with pain. Comfort flees from pain, and joy embraces it as God's work in our lives. Comfort leads to a, a selective involvement in the lives of others based upon preference, whereas joy leads us to active involvement in others' even those different than us, because our lives are based on His love. So I end with you today where I often end with you and where I often begin with you in recent years of talking and again trying to sell you on a very difficult and unpopular idea. And that is that real joy that brings satisfaction in life is not to be found in our comfort, as nice as that is nor the meeting of our personal needs and desires and preferences. There's comfort in that when that happens, and it's nice when it happens, but real joy in our lives is to be found not by looking for our comfort, but by looking away from ourselves to give ourselves away to God and other people. Paul and Silas did not hold on to their comforts. If they did, they would have never gone on the missionary journey. They would have never gotten around those Gentile people. They would have never seen all those countercultural people things happened that indeed did transpire. They could have stayed at home in some nice Jewish context where everyone agreed with them and looked like them and they could have fellowship together in life and great fun and comfort one with another. But rather they looked away from self. And so our final thought is to say that serving away from self and from personal desires and regular happiness does not sound enjoyable. And there are certain ways in which it is not. But there is a joy in the journey. There are partners along the way who even in the midst of suffering are partners with us in that suffering as together we serve the Lord and in doing that we find God's pleasure and we find a joy that's bigger than comfort and is bigger than happiness. So as we go to prayer to ask that God would make us those kinds of people, uh, today I, I especially pray for some friends of ours uh, who are leaving us today. Uh, Siri and Barbara and the children will be, even this evening, getting on the plane and flying back to France. And so we have enjoyed the journey together with these folk. They go back to a culture that's um, a little more harsh than ours, to a culture, as we've talked about, that um, kind of our culture is moving much rapidly toward a very similar culture as to what they live in, in terms of being kind of out of step with the broader and culture so we pray for them, that God would use them uh, magnificently as they go home, as we give thanks for them, and as we pray that we would learn from them and from the Scriptures to truly be people who serve well in the culture in which we find ourselves. Father, today we do give you thanks for our friends, for Siri and Barb, and for the three years that we sojourned together here uh, in this community and in the States um, we thank you for them and our, our brother and sister in the faith and their dear children. 
uh, Lord, as they return to France. Bless them there. Uh, give them joy as they return and serve in that culture, in that context, and multiply their ministries in marvelous ways. We pray that they'd be able to look back uh, even upon these years and see how these years were instrumental in the large plan and the tapestry of their lives that you are weaving together. So bless them, Lord, we pray. And bless us here as well as we seek to be your people, and as we seek to do things that are very countercultural, that are very much away from a sense of self, but rather to a sense of serving others and worshiping you and praying to you and trusting you even in the darkest of times and whatever may be the prison experiences of our lives. Give us that endurance and fortitude in the midst of those opportunities that we may truly be your faithful people, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The youth are going to...